um, it's going direct from the microphones to the sound. So we have to be really, really careful today to do it properly. Okay. Let us know when we're live. It's related to feedback from one of the residents. Yeah. yeah. What's that? It's not good. We're, we're just doing it. Okay, good Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Good evening, everyone. Um, good evening. Welcome, everyone, to, to the Health and Social Care Scrutiny Commission, which is being held in person. My name is Councillor Victoria Lisa, and I'm the chair of the, this commission. Before we start the meeting, I have a few housekeeping um, announcements to make. There, no, there are no planned fire alarm tests this evening that I know of. But if you do hear the fire alarm, please leave by the nearest fire exit, which is behind me, and make your way to the agreed assembly point, which is St. John's Churchyard off Druid Street. Council security staff will be available to direct you to that meeting point. The public toilets are located off the main reception area uh, to the left hand side. I would ask if everyone please switch your mobile phones off, I think I have to do that myself, to, to silent whilst in the meeting room. Members of the public are welcome to film, record, photograph or tweet or, or tweet um, the public proceedings of this meeting. But I'd ask you to please be considerate towards other people in the room and, care, and take care not to disturb the proceedings. Um, if you're filming the meeting, please do not film the audience. We're not going to do that when we're going to audit at the moment. A copy of the Council's protocol for reporting and filming is available on the Southwark website. And the code for accessing the council's Wi-Fi is capital F small r three three Wi-Fi exclamation mark. As I said, if accessing the council's Wi-Fi, it's um, uh, capital F R three three Wi-Fi exclamation mark. As I said, this meeting is being live streamed via Zoom platform to YouTube and will be uploaded to Southern Council's YouTube channel by tomorrow, which is um, Thursday the eighteenth of November. Bearing in mind that this meeting has been live streamed, if you're planning to speak, you may choose to switch off your camera if you're participating online and so that only your voice can be heard. May I remind members to raise your hand if you wish to speak and please wait until I give you permission to speak before contributing to this meeting. And finally, in the interest of health and safety, please remember to wear a mask, face covering while moving around the building unless you're exempt. You, you may take them off while seated. Okay. Okay, if we can just go through um, any apologies for absence. Have we got any apologies? Yes, um, we've got an apology from Councillor Dora dixon -Fell. Dora dixon file. Okay. Okay. Any other apologies? No. No, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll do confirmation of voting members. Um, Please can voting members present in the room and the scrutiny project manager please introduce yourself. I will start with myself. I'm Councillor Victoria Lisa, Goose Green Labour, and I'm a voting member. Uh, I'm Hilly Timbrell and I'm the project manager for the scrutiny commission. Councillor Bill Williams, voting member. Uh, Councillor David Noakes, Vice Chair of the Commission and uh, Councillor in uh, Borough Bankside Ward. Councillor Sandra Rule, voting member, Nuned and Queen's Road Ward. Councillor Maria Nifors Hall, voting member and Councillor for St George's Ward. Thank you, members. And, and before you leave, can you please um, sign in the attendance sheet as well? So that's a hard copy of who was here. Thank you. Um, if we go to, I just assume everyone's got a, a paper agenda or agenda on their um, computer. Um, Notification any items of business which the chair deems urgent. I've got no urgent items that come to my attention at the moment. Um, is there any disclosure of interest and dispensations? Do any members have any declarations of any interest or dispensations in respect of any item of business to be considered at this meeting? Any member? No, chair. There's nobody who's got partners who work in NHS, etc. 
counseling for the you? only thing that I want to disclose is that I am the director of Suman Omega, that is an agency, a charity that deals with domestic violence. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Enford Hall. Okay. Councillor Williams? Yes, Chair, my part my partner works for the NHS Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. Thank you for that. I just wanted to give my councillor colleague member, councillor Charlie Smith, time to sit down. We just, just Apologies, no, just taking final introductions. If you just introduce yourself, thank you. Just to confirm, councillor Charlie Smith, um, Goose Green Ward, voting members just arrived. Thank you. If, so if there's no other disclosure of interest and dispensations, um, we, if we look through the minutes of the last meeting, the 30th of September, has everyone got a copy of that, either hard copy or on their um, laptop? That's on the supplementary agenda. If it's, it's your pages, um, pages one to six. Um, I'm just checking. Is there any matters arising from that? Okay. If there's no matter arising, um, the members who are there, does anyone want to? Want to um, I'm going to propose that we um, consider them accurate reflection of the last meeting. Yeah. I'll propose it, Chair, because I was there. Sorry, do you want to propose it, Sandra? Yeah, I propose. I'm happy to second that. Thank you. If we go to item number five, I'm just happy to welcome the Cabinet Member and Councillor Evelyn Koto, who's the Cabinet Member for Health and Wellbeing and everything else, because that just covers a little bit, that title bit covers a lot. Here to be interviewed on her portfolio enclosed in the main agenda. Councillor Okoto, thank you. And also I think she's got her co colleague, the new director, Sangeeta. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is um, Councillor Evelyn Okoto. I'm the Cabinet Member for Public Health and Wellbeing. Good evening everyone, Sangeet Leahy, Director of Public Health. Okay. Evelyn, I don't, you don't want to give a snapshot of your portfolio, or you just want to just take questions? Yeah. Um, I think the only thing I will say is obviously that the, the past what, eight, 20 or months has been quite difficult for both portfolios. Obviously, I've got public health or public health. I've been leading on a um, COVID um, response, a pandemic. And obviously, we have uh, adult social care and they have been um, badly impacted by the pandemic. So obviously I've got two portfolios that I've been, I wouldn't say struggling, but I've been really at the kind of epicenter of dealing with um, the current situation that we, are, we face ourselves in. And quite frankly, to be, to be honest, we're not out of the woods yet, Even though, regardless of the rhetoric from um, central government, we are still seeing high numbers um, in COVID numbers within the borough and across London. So just to say, I just wanted to really take this opportunity to say thank you to all our um, officers from public health and adult social care for all the great work they've been doing. Thank you. Sangeeta, I don't know if you wanted to take this opportunity at the moment to obviously bring everyone up to speed because you've replaced Kevin Benton and, and Jin, is it Jin Lin? Thank you. Thank you. So I started in post in late March um, and since then the figures, uh, COVID rates have been up and down. They um, started to drop um, throughout summer, but then unfortunately, um, as models started to rise again and continued to rise throughout the autumn, 
with um, the return of schools and um, with an increase in people socialising after um, all restrictions were lifted across the country. So um, we continue to um, monitor that regularly and of course we've got a whole programme of work um, about prevention and containing the outbreak, uh, which I'm, I'm really happy to, to answer any questions on as well, together with Councillor Koto. Members, anybody uh, take any questions? Moment. First, um, Councillor Williams, and then Councillor Noakes. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Thank you both for coming. Um, I wanted to talk about local health services and GP practices, but on the back of coming out of the COVID pandemic and the restrictions to that. Um, during the pandemic, um, all GP practices were doing telephone consultations and only doing physical consultations if it was considered an emergency. Um, as I know that the numbers are still high across the borough, but as we're coming out of national restrictions, um, I wonder if you care to comment on or if you know of and any of the GP practices that are reluctant to re-engage with face-to-face -face appointments and they're still trying to push as, as a first option telephone consultations and I'm getting an awful lot of casework of, of constituents complaining is, a, is, is the right word of, of not being able to go back to how it was and I wonder if there's, there's now a move with local health services to offer a hybrid service? And if so, how is that being communicated out? I'll start now. Um, that's a very good question, um, um, Councillor Williams, because I think I've been getting cases um, and emails about this as well and concerns from residents. I think what I do know is that as um, I've said that the rates were beginning to drop um, and people expected more face-to-face -face consultation, that wasn't happening. Um, and what was happening is that uh, I think and it varied um, depending on surgeries. Um, we're deciding to continue that, that kind of telephone um, um, counselling and, and support of residents. Because of the, I wouldn't say backlash, but because of the concerns raised, and there's been a lot of concerns raised with not just myself or other councillors, but the CCG as well. I know there has been discussions about, you know, what we do going forward. I do think that there was a, poss a possible move uh, by some of our surgeries to maintain as long as possible um, that kind of telephone um, consultation, mainly because of, and I think what I heard is that because of the um, kind of fluctuation of numbers, they were trying to keep it as long as possible. I know there's a discussion about hybrid, um, again, but there is concerns about that. And I remember there was a, a recent meeting I had with GPs and I did express frustration within our communities about this um, and how long this will take for us to go back to normal, as it were. Um, there is, things are still up in the air. Um, I do think surgeries will decide individually how to take things forward. I do think some are moving faster than others. But I, uh, what I will say is that we just have to keep on um, repeating what residents are saying um, to us, to our NHS partners, to make sure that we get back to some sort of normality. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and the only thing I would add to that is, um, of course, hybrid does suit some some people yeah. um, and some people, perhaps younger generation, do prefer that. However, um, GP colleagues who I talk to are acutely aware that you cannot spot everything through virtual consultation. So it's about um, the GPs being able to pick up where they need to see people face to face, I think. Yeah, I, I, if I can do a supplemental. Um, I, I agree, and I think hybrid is probably the way to go. Um, speaking from personal experience, um, if you miss a telephone appointment, um, you've missed that telephone appointment. Um, and you and, and often they will say, we will call you between three o'clock and three fifteen. And 
Shores X as X at 310, you get called somewhere by a colleague and you've missed the GP appointment and that's it. And you've got to go through the whole rigmarole of the next morning, ringing at 8 a.m. and hanging on the line till 10 a.m. to get appointment for them to ring you the following day at 12 p.m. It's not as good as it not could be, but as it should be at this point and i think that's from a personal perspective but also from a perspective of my constituents that's the main bugbear is the inflexibility of the current system thank you councillor noakes yeah. do i get more than one question <laughs> i mean i can ask one at a time if you like if that's <laughs> to allow member, other members but um uh, nice to see you evening um so I guess I want to, my first question would be around the COVID-19 pandemic. Obviously, as you say, that has obviously dominated things for the last 20 months. Um, and obviously, I have some shared knowledge with you around sitting on the Health and Wellbeing Board and also the group around vaccination levels in the borough. And it seems to me that we've got to a stage where, you know, our, our vaccination levels continue to be below most other boroughs in the UK. Um, perhaps similar to some of our similar demographic boroughs in London, but um, it's only lower than the national average. And uh, to me, following an evidence base, it seems to me that there's, there's plenty of evidence uh, exists now out there about the effectiveness of vaccines um, and how in every demographic group, age group, um, if you've had the vaccine and you've been doubly vaccinated, that you're less likely to have severe illness and to end up in hospital. Um, but despite that, obviously, we still have significant numbers of people who've chosen not to get vaccinated. And I know we've sort of discussed how we might be able to encourage people to to get that vaccination. But I just thought, um, I just wondered if you have any further reflections on particular communities. And I'm thinking, obviously, particularly the Afro-Caribbean community, um, and perhaps slightly less so of the African community. But um, about what more we could do, I suppose, if, if we assume that maybe an evidence base rationale on its own is not going to be enough what more we could do to to increase those vaccination levels and i wanted to, to perhaps seek your opinion about the um if you wish to give it uh, about the vaccine the compulsory vaccination of care home staff and the impending um mandatory uh, requirement probably for health staff as well uh, in april next year okay big questions um i think with what more we can do with the vaccine as a a really big question and as, as you said we've been in meetings cracking our brains about what we can do how we can not persuade but just get that information out we've done so many things within um, Southwark door to door we've done um, kind of culturally sensitive um, meetings we've done meetings in native languages we've done a vaccine van we've done pop-ups you name it we've done it um, I do think however we are the group of people that it will take for them, I would say time, for them to come on board. Um, I do remember initially at the beginning of this discussions with um, some of our groups and a lot of people will say, okay, I may take it, but I just wanna see what happens. And a lot of people are just waiting to see what happens to those who have taken the vaccine, because unfortunately people are still thinking this is an exper experimental, experimental uh, drug. Uh, of vaccines so people are still thinking it has been tested enough the issue of um, kind of you know how vigorous were we with you know making sure that it was safe people are still questioning that so time i think will tell and i do think and it, it, it's interesting because i mean if you look at our data obviously we know that the uh, black caribbeans are the lowest group uh, of take up but they are coming up slowly so unfortunately, I do think it will be time. And I do think maybe a year or so down the line, people will come up knowing that, you know, my neighbor's taking it and she's walking around, she's fine. People will come on board and take it. The other issue is, um, and I'm not sure how many of you have seen this on social media, it's just the, the kind of concoction that people are using to defend themselves of um, uh, um, the, 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 the virus. I had, to, unfortunately, had a, a, I went door knocking over the weekend and one, guy who was had uh, underlying health um, issues came up and said he has got a, a concoction which consists of lemon and uh, you know all together and he swears by it that that's what's going to help him and he told all his family to use that I, I stood there for 20 minutes trying to explain the importance of getting the vaccine uh, but he you know he's still adamant so we're still battling for a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there which unfortunately it seems to be 
continuing even though we have um, facts. So I do think time is um, the thing that we will have to kind of use and wait and see how things um, pan out. But in the meantime, we are still going out to communities. We are still talking. We are still making sure our health ambassadors are going to, um, uh, like I said, the Caribbean communities um, with information and making sure that people have the right information to make an informed choice. With regards to the, um, uh, mandatory vaccination, now I, I have t I'm two minds about that. You're smiling because you probably know what I'm thinking. Um, I'm in two minds about that. I do, I do think, you know, it's really unhelpful um, to kind of go down the line of forcing people to take um, something that they are, have concerns about. You know, a lot of people have concerns. It could be culturally, could be faith-wise, etc. And I do think, again, it comes to time. I do think it's about working through those concerns with them. However, I do understand the importance of protecting especially our vulnerable um, communities because obviously if you look at um the the the, the virus age is a factor um in, in being able to kind of you know either you you know you have it and, and you you come out of it well or, or you don't um so i am in two minds about it but i do think the way it has been done um with giving such a short deadline I, I do think it's a short deadline uh, for people to really have time to really think about it and, and, and get the support they need to be able to make an informed decision i think it's a problem and, and now we're moving on to all health um, i do think you know health is going to suffer already we have there's a lot of vacancies in the hospitals i do think we're gonna have a problem going forward um so yeah i mean two minds and i think i'll leave you there anything else you want to add to that you don't have to <laughs> i think you've covered it okay Okay. Do you want Maria? And then I'll ask a question. And Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I want to say congratulations for the fantastic job you do, Evelyn. I think you you cover all the points, all the angles, and it's, it's very impressive. And it's a, a pleasure to work with you across party um, because you, you you cover everything. You cover everything that needs to be done. Um, I think that Bill uh, already has asked a question, and you covered it, which is going from um, an online service to being face-to-face. -face. We already started doing that during the pandemic, because basically we couldn't see anybody face-to-face, -face, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work because a lot of people hate telephones, a lot of people hate um, uh, well, long telephone conversations, is it not okay for them to call you and to say, can I have a meeting or whatever, but anything longer than that and, or explanations, they don't want it. They want to see you face to face. And so that was my only thing to say, it doesn't work. You have to, at one stage or another, do either a mixture of both or go back to face to face. Thank you for that. That was the only comment. Thank you. We have been discussing, um, and, and my point has always been: you think about what the patient need, what do the resident need, you know. And as you say, there are lots of, and I've heard some really horror stories of you know cancer being missed, yeah. you know. Um, so th there is that issue, and, and I think it, for us, it's about repeating this that you know what our resident need is to come back to face to face i know that the gps uh, are under an enormous stress you know and they've been doing an excellent job as well you know but i think as we are all looking forward i think we have to get back to some kind of normality and look at the best way for our residents yeah. thank you yeah so i i want to say about the face to face um last week i had um i flaked out on the bus on wednesday um, coming up to Tooley Street, um, and the doctor 111 rang me at 2.20 a.m. after they said they were going to ring me in a couple of hours. Um, and with my personal GP, I had an appointment with him this Monday gone at 10.50. He didn't ring until 12 something. Um, so I could have been just hanging, waiting indoors for him to ring. And then when he finally got on the phone, he was he was really good and everything, but he had to divide my appointment into two appointments. So my next appointment is tomorrow between half nine and 10. So I don't know. I, I personally think face to face is best. And also for certain skin problems, what you're going to do, you're going to share your camera to show them your skin tags or whatever. I, I really think certain things you just have to see face to face. So I would prefer face to face to come back. 
hybrid if we must, but face to face is the way to go. The other thing I wanted to say is about the only time I've been trolled lately as a counsellor is when I'm trying to con convince my fellow BMEs to get the vaccine. So uh, I've, I've retweeted something the other day because I've got my flu jab and being very good. I've booked my booster and I actually got a, te um, a reply saying RIP, rest in peace, you know, because there are certain, I don't know, I don't know how we're going to convince certain groups of people, you know, it, we could have this vaccine for two years. I know somebody I spent a whole hour in Lucas Gardens trying to persuade her to go and get her vaccine. I even volunteered to go with her. She's got other family members who've had it done, you know, her grown up kids, her her sister, who's roughly about a couple of years older than her, and she still hasn't gone to get her jab. So I think some people, because of what's online, will never get it done, I'm afraid. And then the other thing I'd like to know is, um, how are we doing with our booster jabs in Southwark? Because uh, you get the national numbers um, and as Southwark News will tell us about the, the jabs, but how, how the booster jabs, we don't seem to have any data on it yet so far. So I'd like to know. So, Sangeet, I don't know if you've got those figures. Yeah. Okay. Can I just say, I mean, with regards to the hesitancy, uh, um, on the vaccine, I think it's important to say that this we've had this um, hesitancy before um, COVID came, you know, before the COVID vaccination came. I mean, we have a, a number of vaccinations within the borough that we see this level of hesitancy with it. So it's not just COVID. It's not. It's not new. Um, so I think it's really important to, to to note that. But I think what it is, I think the, the, the problem is for a lot of people that has come on so far. So for them, they just can't get their head around, you know, if safety measures were um, kind of hampered because of that. So it is about making sure that we keep repeating all the messages that we have been repeating and then we, sort, we support people to get the right information and make sure that people have access to information. Um, with regards to the, the booster jabs, I think, mean, our what I've got in front of me, I'm not sure if we've got an updated one, that over 31,000 have received a booster jab, um, booster dose of the vaccine, and that's equivalent to 70% of the eligible population. That's the latest I have um, of the booster jab. But it, Can in I it, just, sorry yeah. to interrupt, um, Evelyn, you said um, 31,000. Is this in Southwark? Yes. Okay, and Southwark, I'm reading the populations about somewhere about 313,000. 313, so for me, that equates to 10%, but you're saying 70%. Of the eligible population. But eligible, is that over 60 or 70? Yeah. yeah, when you say eligible, so is this anybody over 50? Yeah. 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 Okay. Because right now, they just started the 40 Because Because that's what I'm saying, because really they started over 70s, yeah. over 60, and they're coming down. Yeah. Okay. Because when you, that oh, sounds okay. really yeah. thing, but then when you put it relatively, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So just on the, the eligibility, so of course, even if you are over 40 or over 50, you've still got to wait six months from your second dose yeah. before you can, before you're eligible for the yeah. booster. Yeah. And some people, as we know, either chose to wait a little bit longer or um, are the younger age group and they aren't quite there yet. So it might be next year that we're still talking about some of the over 40s before their six month time period is there. Okay. Right. I just want to follow up a quick question from Bill, um, putting on my trade union hat on. I think we are concerned as one of the large trade unions about uh, obviously the hesitancy and the lack of take up, but also we've been dealing with the issues of a significant number of people over the last sort of six months who may lose their jobs because of the mandatory vaccination. And it's about saying, what can we do as a local authority to try and support? I don't know whether it's a two-tongue approach working with employers to try and convince workers because we're, because from our background, we're concerned because it's mainly women in the care sector who are going to lose their jobs. And the cut-off date was sort of last week and some of them will be given an extra two, three, three weeks, but we will be losing, with, not a word of a lie, thousands of people because there's a lot of people who are concerned and not to take the vaccination. They may have underlying health issues, but then medical exemption doesn't seem to come onto that. So I don't know whether we as a local authority can try and support our local residents to say, there's a reason why I should take it because, you know, I hate to say in first case scenario, they're going to lose their jobs. A second case scenario, you protect them and their family. And there's a, you know, rollout from that. It's not just about just protecting them, it's protecting their livelihood as well. Because if not, there's going to be a whole tier of people. We're talking thousands, not the odd hundred thousands of people who will, they don't take, start taking their vaccination in the next week or so you know, people are going to be lose their jobs. So, you know, so when they say in the 
you know, in, in, in the national press about 60 to 80,000 people. I think there's a lot more than that. It's just that's a conservative estimate. So what can we do as local authority to try and encourage our local residents, even from the side of, you know, help you keep your job, but also at the same time, your health and well-being for you and your family? Thank you. That's a really important question. And I think, first of all, it's important to say that we've been doing this from when we knew about the mandated vaccination policy. We've been doing this. We've been working with GPs, public health officers, um, adult care, um, social care officers have been going in, speaking to providers, asking what more can we do to support? I know that um, GPs and public health officers have been going in to support and, and, and speak to workers that have not um, at that point come forward to have the vaccination to answer their questions. You know, there, there were provisions for workers to get vaccinated on site. So all of that was provided. Um, and I, I remember just on the first date, um, the deadline for the first um, dose, we, are, we went back to providers and asked, what more can we do? And they did came back and said, actually, you've done everything that you need to do right now. So it, right now it's about waiting game. I, I can say right now there's, there's no care home in Southern that is at risk of closing because of this mandated um, policy. Um, we, we do know that out of, I think, about 16 um, care homes, all the um, workers that don't want to be vaccinated are in the single digits. There's only one hope that in the double digits. And, and again, we're working with that provider to see what's been done. I know that a lot are being redeployed and unfortunately a lot will, will lose their job as well. But it's making sure. And I think my, we have, I have been emailing and, and speaking to providers for a while. And my, my point is we have to support them as much as possible. So if we can redeploy them to other areas, let's do that. Um, but I, I, I am happy to say that actually in Southwark, we are not at risk of closing any of our care homes because of this. Um, you want to take uh, Charlie hey, and then Maria? Yeah, I'll, I'll ask, ask a couple of things. I, I missed you this afternoon. Yeah, I just got back. Oh, sorry. That's it. Now the world can hear. Um, a, a hybrid um, uh, examination or meeting, what, what was that? Just a phone call, do you know? Okay, so a hybrid, um, from my understanding, it will be, so it is either offering a face-to-face -face or offering a phone call. I know they think about other te technologies, so um, it well, is that option yeah, of having yeah. either or. So that's the very point I was going to make, you know, if for older people or poorer people yeah. who don't have that technology. Exactly. And, and the yeah. fact that how can you show someone, I don't know, a, a rash or an ingrained toenail over the phone? Yeah. This is it. And I, I, I am concerned about the some of the GP practices in our borough, well, all over the place, actually, who who just keep taking on pa uh, patients. Yeah. Uh, they get, uh, you go in the surgeries if you ever get in, and it does say, please register, new patients welcome. And I think they're overextended. That's half the battle with them. Yeah. I know that the moment, you know, the last year or so, they've had to deal with, Home, home visits, I suppose, people who've had um, the, the virus and that. Uh, but nevertheless, I do wonder, because, you know, for every patient they got on their books, there's an annual payment, as you, yeah. even, in, even if they never see them. So yeah. that, that's, if they get a bit greedy, that's what I do. Um, I mean, from the bus, you don't have any old out and about as you used to. So we really, really are worried about being out there, being in shops. And my concern is that maybe next year or whenever, when, when older people do feel more confident to get back and join groups and do things like that, they'll have issues with um, um, joints, muscles, Mental health problems. This is one of the big ones. I imagine <clears throat> is going to be confronting us, and how we're we're going to confront that. And the very last thing was about trying to Afri Afro Caribbean or African people persuade them. Do we ever get into the pulpits at all? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we? Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's I've good. Seen it. Even online. Yeah. Even online sessions, I've seen where they've had the the pastor or the aman. Um, do their service and say to their members to get jabs. That's I've great. seen it online. Because someone like Dora would be great, wouldn't she? You know, yeah. So, 
and uh, she'd be a great role model. I had somebody moan yeah. at me because Southwark went to them door to door to say, try and persuade them. And I said, don't talk to me about it. That You're lucky we're coming out, you know? Yeah, uh, that's fine. I mean, with regards to list size, um, obviously it's something I would take back um, to the CCG, CCG to make sure that, you know, no surgery is of exerting themselves as it were. Um, but I, and as I've said, I think it does vary um, through surgeries. I do know some surgeries are seeing older people face to face. I know my surgery does. Um, so it does seem to be vary. So it's something that we need to try and standardize. But I do share your concern about older people and, and making sure that they get an opportunity to see the doctor face to face. I, I would just say that we have recently been notified that unfortunately some of our surgeries and our GPs are you know are being targeted and a lot of people are being violent towards them and it's not just in South it seems to be across the board um so I think it's really important you know as people are getting frustrated that you know we also realize they're under huge pressure as well so I think it's, it's worth noting that with the faith leaders, yes, we've done a number of sessions with faith leaders. Um, also making sure that faith leaders have the right information themselves, yeah. have an opportunity to ask us questions. We've offered to be able to, to go to any kind of um, events they're doing to be able to speak to the congregation. So we have been liaising with um, faith groups and we continue to do that as well. That's good. Can I just follow up with that? I think even after COVID, because there will be a post-COVID time, I think that work to continue any of our engagement with the communities, because I think I'm concerned that after COVID's finished or whatever, everybody will go back to being entrenched and like, okay, we don't believe in this, because I hear what Sandra said. I don't, you know, my social media has gone really quiet because I thought I'm not going to post anything on there because people just jump on it and they'll say, you're trying to push this agenda and that agenda. And sometimes it's about people's health and well-being. And there's so many conspiracy theory every week. There's a different one. And sometimes that is, I hate to say, perpetuated, perpetuated in religious bodies, either churches, mosques and whatever. And, and you see all the WhatsApp and you think this is ridiculous. And the poor people who come to church or whatever probably bombarded all that information and you can't have that clear vision of like what is best for me and my family and that's why I just think we have to tackle them on different angles even if it's just an angle of keeping you in your employment and whatever because for some people I mean the, the members I'm dealing with are women most of them are over age 50 and they've been working that care home for 20 30 years if they lost their job now it'd be devastating for their family but the point is that is the whole fear of oh my gosh oh my gosh they've heard the conspiracy theory about this is targeted to our communities and whatever and it's all that nonsense and all that dispelling of that is going to take more than the rest of the year. It's going to take the next two, three years to convince them to be more engaged in the health service and think about their health and well-being. And a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of the people in those communities have got underlying serious medical conditions they're not dealing with. Yeah, um, I, I, I really worry about it, you know, because, I mean, you know, if you go on my Facebook, you see my skinny arm getting done. But I did meet this woman and I think she thinks that it is targeted to um, ethnic communities because she said, oh, Sandra, whatever you say, I'm not going to have it done. And the reason she, she, even the flu jab, she reckons, and this was before, you know, even the flu jab, she says, I'm, I'm going to just take my chances. You know, it, I, I really, that is one of the few things I do worry about because the, the, the most common one I got was they're targeting basically black people to experiment on. And then the other thing I got was, even though the, the needle is so thin, I don't believe that Bill Gates can get a chip in it. You know what I mean? Um, so, so that's the most popular yeah. one I've heard. Yeah, thanks, Sandra. Um, let's um, Councillor Noakes and then Councillor Linford Hall, please. You had another question. If not, I can go to. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I, I sort of I suppose just following on from the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, and I guess what is remind one of the things it's reminded us of is I guess the health inequalities that exist within our within our borough. Um, I mean, obviously it's something that we knew, I guess, but in a sense it's been starkly um, illustrated by the by the pandemic. And taking that into account, I know it's some, certainly something that we we have at the heart of considerations on the health and wellbeing board. But do you have any sort of thoughts about how we're going to tackle those health inequalities and? Um, would you want to sign up to any sort of targets about how we would, what sort of positive progress we might see in reducing health inequalities and what you think the priorities should be to achieve that? <laughs> Indeed, that's a 
And it's interesting, I've actually got my, uh, my uh, lead member briefing tomorrow, and the Southern Joint Health and Wellbeing Strategy is going to be presented, and the focus is going to be on inequalities. So we have, we have produced a new joint um, strategy, and the focus has to be, not just because of uh, the pandemic, has to be on closing that inequalities gap. I mean, currently in Southern, we, you can live for women, I think there's an 80 years um, life expectancy gap, living from the poorest areas to the more affluent areas in one borough. Yeah. And we know that over the years, I and mean, if you look at the, you read the Baba review, over the years across the country, that kind of inequality has widened as opposed to closing the gap. And it obviously, and obviously um, the pandemic has exacerbated that. So it is about looking at what currently is happening, what is the current situation within the borough. And yes, if we have to look at targets, put on targets. But it is about working with all our partners because we know that you know there's a, a wider determinant of, of someone's life that you know that kind of impacts on their health. So it's not just about the council; it's about uh, NHS partners. It is about you know SLAM. It's about mental health provision. It's about all the partners around the health table and how we work together. But inequality is definitely is a focus. And when I get my um, my briefing, I'll give you more information on that. The only thing I'd add is um, the, it's very timely because, of course, we're refreshing the health and wellbeing strategy, and that is an absolute key component, um, not just looking at how do we reduce health inequalities, but given the fact that they have um, obviously expanded throughout COVID, how do we look at that? But how do we involve the community to actually listen to what they have to say about it and bring them with us? So for them, it's not going to be just another dusty strategy sitting on the shelf. That's what we really want to try and do this time. And we're engaging with the Health and Wellbeing Board, um, hopefully in a workshop in December, to talk about how we might do that together with the community. And can I just say, I mean, our um, Southwark standing together is all about inequalities. It's all about closing that, you know, addressing that inequalities issue that we have. That structural racism that we have in our society. How do we make sure that everyone is supported to reach a, a level and is not subject to your race or you know where you come from? So you know that inequality piece is always at the back of our minds, but now it has to come. It has to be more tangible now. And I'm hoping that, that the joint strategy will make it tangible, working with our communities and making and letting people know that we're really serious about this. I mean, I want to live in, in a borough whereby. You know, my life expectancy is not, de you know, it's not determined by where I live. I, mean, I find that really hard to even think about that it still exists. And so, you know, this is a focal point and I hope uh, you're part of the Health and Wellbeing Board. So hopefully we get all the brains around the table and make sure that we do something tangible for our communities. Thank you. If, the final two um, questions from um, Councillor Marie Lindworth Hall and then Councillor Charlie Smith. Thank you, Chair. Um, is one big concern that I have, especially with the Latin American community, that uh, they're having a campaign going on at the moment that says that children are not, we are not an experiment, they said. And so the parents are saying, no, you are not going to vaccinate our children. And also it is well known that the children can be asymptomatic and they can pass the the, the, the virus to, to, to others. Um, what is the council going to do to perhaps do a campaign in the schools or something to try to stop this be a stupid belief that children are experiment? Thank you. Thank um, you. And I think for me, when I heard that um, the vaccination is going to be rolled out to the younger um, cohort, I did, I did envisage this happening. Um, obviously, we have it. We, we're, we're tackling with hesitancy with adults, you know. And I, do, I did think, okay, if we go down to children, I know there's going to be a stronger resistance to it. Um, there has been opportunities in, in our schools for um, students to be vaccinated. Um, there, had, there were low take ups for various reasons. Um, and I know the CCG, the last time we spoke, they are providing other alternative and, you know, coming back to schools to give them that opportunity. We've also went back to um, head teachers to ask them what they think the concerns are. Because I think sometimes we can think we know the answers, but it's, it's really good to talk to them. So we spoke to head teachers. They've told us what they feel could help with um, helping um, um, parents. And so we're acting on that. There has been a session with um, uh, health partners, with parents, 
just for parents to answer their questions and, and answer, you know, what the concerns they have. So we are tackling and being proactive in tackling parents and making sure that we give them the the, the, the responses that they need to feel assured that, you know, the vaccine is good for the, the young people. We also know that young people can take the decision on their themselves. You know, they can decide, okay, regardless of parental um, agreement, that they can have their vaccine. But I think we all know, especially in, uh, say, African household, that, you know, that doesn't work. Your parent will decide what happens to you, especially if you're 12. Yeah. Um, so we have to work through the, through the parents and make sure there's more opportunities um, for them to be vaccinated and, and assure them that the vaccination is safe. Anything you want to add to that? The only thing I'd add is, of course, um, it, it's taking time for some adults to change their mind and people are even more protective of their children than they are of, um, of themselves sometimes. So it's just continually communicating with our uh, communities, our children, our adult population to talk about the benefits and how it's completely safe. And we will just carry on talking to our communities for as, as long as we need to do so. Where you wanted to do a final comment very, very quickly because I've got to go on to. Um, very even quick. if the adults have had the vaccine and even if the adults are convinced that, well, okay, I think that especially if I have to work and they ask me for a certificate or ask me something, have I been vaccinated? And I say no, then I'm going to lose my job. So the parents are convinced of that, but they are definitely against their children being vaccinated. So I don't know what it is in their mind, but a friend of mine, a Latin American friend of mine, said to me, my child is not an experiment and I'm not going to have him vaccinated. And she is having a campaign, a social media campaign, really, really strong among the Latin American community, saying children are not experiment. And the children are the people who are speaking on this video and saying we are not experiment. So that is, I think, to ask the children to do that sort of thing is irresponsible in my opinion, but so that, that's what's happening. Thank you. Just before I go to Councillor Charlie Smith, I'm just thinking that maybe, you know, um, Evelyn, when you're saying ongoing after COVID, we need to engage with our communities. And I think maybe we need to scope that in forever and ever it's not just after covid you know particular communities black and african communities this is the line that we have to con conspiracy theory in latin american community continue that conversation over the next two to five to ten years because if not unfortunately the next virus or issue the same nonsense will come through and like you're saying if people are going on social media and whatever they're putting all their energies in that and the poor young people who are going to suffer and it's like like you're saying after COVID, we still have to continue these conversations with these particular communities. And maybe we have to find a fund to just fund that within public health. So it's not just we've dealt with COVID now, we can go back to the new normal messages. It might be concerted effort with the BME and Latin American communities over the next five to 10 years, consistent messages, consistent, you know, evidence-based information all the time. Because if not, the next thing that's going to come through next time will be Spanish flu or whatever, whatever different thing. And then it'll be a whole raft of no, more conspiracy theories. And no, we're not going to take the flu jab because this is what happens. Because I'm concerned that after COVID, everyone will just forget and oh, effort, we'll sort of go back to normal. And these communities are going to stay entrenched with their conspiracy theories really strong. I, I totally agree with you. And I think I think at a previous scrutiny meeting, I, I did say that this has to be a continual thing. Um, and I did say um, kind of initiatives like the health ambassadors has to be a long term thing that it stays. We have to keep it for a while, a long while to make sure we can continue to, to, to work with our communities. I mean, we do have a grant um, in public health. Um, and I think that the recent grant went out I think last month, uh, I believe. And that is giving grants to um, particular groups or kind of organization to work with particular groups that we're concerned for, for example, older people um, and, and different ethnicity to work with them and how basically about the about the COVID, but also how to get them more mobile, you know, health wise, how to promote good health, you know, eating, etc. But is that kind of targeted support has to continue for a long while. Um, and this is something that we are planning to keep for a while and making sure that, you know, we don't just stop when the, the numbers drop, because as you say, you don't know when something else is gonna um, rise again. But I think our, our we know the communities that we need to continue to help and support, and we have to keep doing that. Councillor Smith, final comments or Thank questions? Much, yeah. Um, I went to a lecture the other year given by Professor John Moxon, 
Have you heard of him? Yeah, he lives on my road. He retired uh, from Kings last year, and he advocates what he calls the, the vital five. It's fairly common sense stuff. It's high blood pressure, <coughs> smoking, obesity, type of housing, um, something I can't remember. The name of it. Anyway, but what he had a big display on the screen, and, and I thought, I'm looking at this, and it suggested that in as a man in Southwark, 78 was my time up and i thought what hold on a minute then i looked in a bit more detail because i live in dulwich yeah you've got 10 probably, years got on probably 82 yeah and then in nunhead 76 so i'm thinking to myself in this day and age in a in a capital city like this we have these inequalities mm. well, I, you know i just find that so hard to believe it's dreadful it really is and it is common sense stuff you know, he's trying to get people to stop smoking, stop eating junk food, make sure that the type of housing they live in is decent. Oh, we try our best with that, of course. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I mean, oh, I'll end on that, really. Uh, but, yeah, my, my all my three grandchildren have had their jabs. That one, <laughs> 12, 12, 13, 12, 14 and 15. And uh, they're all right. They're just as bloody nuisance as they were before. You know, sorry. Well, thanks for that comment, but I think it is important that those health inequalities, I mean, it's shocking even within borough, within miles and whatever. I don't know what it's like on my estate, but it, it's about access to, you know, basic housing and whatever. But like like you said, Evelyn, those health ambassadors got a lot of work to do and it's got to be long term, five, ten years and making sure that all those key messages continue to continue all the time. Because when people hear of those health inequalities, even within where you live within the borough, people are like, oh, they're shocked. But then they go on to it. If you're on the good side of it, you think, oh, fine, what can we do? But if on the other side, you think, well, this is my life. There's nothing I can do. And it's about empowering people to say you are part of the solution. And we have to, you have to work with the council and empower them to change it. Is there any other final comments? Because I think we've run over time. Can I just yeah. say just one thing? I mean, just on. On, on Charlie's point, I mean, that's why we talk about the wider determinants of health. Yeah. Um, and, and it is about housing, it's about um, finances, how much money you've got in your pocket, it is, it is about, you know, health, it's about smoking, all of that in a round. Um, and in public health, I mean, we're doing things on health checks, you know, making sure that, you know, our black and ethnic minorities, if we know that a majority have a long term condition, that we catch them early. It is about smoking cessation, providing that support for residents who we need to give up smoking for their health in the long, long term. Um, and so all of this, you know, and, and I can see on your agenda, you have the ICS, discussion on the ICS coming up. And the ICS is to come in to help and make sure that the health provision is more a smoother process. And so it's for our, what I would say is that it's important we get the ICS right to, for the benefit or for the betterment of our resident, you know, to make sure that that wider determinant is, is helped because everyone is around the table. And I think I'll just leave that little plug um, yeah. Thank you. If there's no other comments, thank you, Evelyn and Sangeeta. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know we're running a bit late. I'm going to try and catch up time. Um, our next presentation is point number six, which is the impact of Brexit and the pandemic on the NHS workforce. I think online we've got Julie Screeton. Um, Chief People Officer for Guys of St. Thomas and Sarah Morgan. And, the, and um, Julie is the I, I, ICS um, workforce lead. Okay, Julie, are you online? I can't see her. Yes, I'm here. And also my colleague, uh, Mark oh, Preston is here, who's oh, the hi, Mark. Chief People Officer at King's College Hospital. So I think the three of us um, have submitted some evidence that colleagues hope we've had a chance to have a look at. Would you like us just to walk through what our submissions were before we get into questions? Would that be helpful? Yes, that, that'd be helpful. Sorry for I'm turning... Turning around, I can just about see you. Thank you. Go ahead. Sure. Shall I kick off, Mark? Is that okay? We'll do the GSTT um, situation first. So, so thank you for inviting us to, to join you this evening. Um, we were specifically asked to give you some more information around the themes of the pandemic, uh, Brexit, and other kind of hot topics. So from the perspective of, of the pandemic, it's the biggest thing that we're facing as NHS organisations. So even though we're through the worst of the pandemic now, and our COVID numbers are relatively light, our staff are still recovering from an intense period of, of two significant waves of COVID activity on top of elective recovery. So paying attention to health and wellbeing is an absolutely number one priority for, for us all as NHS employers. And through the work we're doing in the ICS, we've invested in health and wellbeing 
uh, support that's accessible across the ICS to both social care staff as well as NHS staff, which we're very pleased to have. And Sarah Morgan, who works with me on the ICS, can give some more detail about that if that would be helpful. So um, despite the, the pressures of the pandemic, we're not really seeing exceptional levels of sickness absence um, or our COVID-related absence is, is significantly low now. And the staff surveys that we run in the NHS every year from a Giles and St Thomas's perspective showed that if the, the pandemic did affect people, but we're not, there's nothing alarming to see at the minute. But with this kind of impact on people, we suspect the effects will be um, coming on into future years. But we are working with a very tired workforce that has had a very difficult time. And so supporting wellbeing continues to be critical. As well as wellbeing, we, because of the pandemic and the kind of command and control situation we operated in, um, we haven't always paid attention to getting some of those basics right. Allowing staff to take annual leave was, was an issue at the peak. And people just getting on good personal development courses, a bit of study leave, kind of went by the wayside so that's a real priority for us um, in terms of getting back to to normal um, we saw quite a stable position in terms of turnover and recruitment of vacancies during the pandemic people stayed with their employers that is now starting to move and it's feeling a bit more like it did in in 2019 but with most most nhs particularly professional staff turnover staff do move between our organizations rather than leaving the the nhs um, itself on um, increasing local employment, we're doing a lot of work. We're very proud of the work we're trying to do around the anchor institution idea. So reaching into communities, working with local education providers as employers and across the integrated care system. And I've listed in my paper just some examples. It's often quite small scale, but relationships we're building through things like Kickstart, relationships with Southwark College that is the beginning of us trying to do more about making us more appealing as a local employer rather than just sticking our adverts onto the whole of the NHS job system and not being mindful about where we recruit. On Brexit, there's not a lot to talk about really from uh, many in London. Um, we have not seen a significant loss of people from the EU on the back of Brexit. Um, we are seeing more people from other parts of the world joining us. So it's becoming more diverse as a workforce in terms of rest of the world recruitment. Um, a lot in my organization, about 20% of our nurses and midwives are from the EU. So retention of that group is absolutely critical. So we monitor that situation very, very carefully going forward. Um, and then in the final part of my paper, it just talks a bit about the work we're trying to do now as an integrated care system, building more of a one workforce approach across health and social care. We look forward to the formal establishment of the ICS as a statutory body from April 22. And I think my colleague Ben Collins is going to be talking more specifically about the ICS uh, later on in this meeting. So I'll probably stop there if that's OK. Would you like to maybe hear from Mark from the King's College perspective before we get into questions? I'll be guided by you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, if we can hear from Mark Preston and then we'll... Okay. Good evening. I'm uh, Mark Preston, as Julie says. I'm the Chief People Officer at, uh, at King's. Our um, situation broadly reflects the same uh, guys um, that Julie's described. So uh, a workforce who've been through significant um, e events over the past 18 months, feeling very tired, um, levels of resilience have been highly uh, tested, and we've tried to put in as much support as we can. Uh, there's a number of things just to add to what Julie said. So we've done similar kind of things in terms of the support we've, we've put in place, but also We've been looking at long COVID clinics. So long COVID is a new thing um, that, uh, that, that we're seeing affecting the staff as well as people outside of the organisation as well. Um, particular support just around some of the kind of daily hygiene things around people taking breaks, having time to rest and proper opportunities to uh, reflect and, um, and, 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 and rest and take the rest that they need. So we've looked across a whole range of things around physical, emotional spiritual and mental support and that's um, outlined mostly in the uh, in the paper a couple of the other things so one thing that we noticed during the first couple of surges of covid was a massive amount of support in the community uh, a lot of donations and um, things that, uh, that 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 were were gifted to kings and to other nhs organizations as well and as as, as we've gone back to business as usual and everybody else has those kind of things of dropped off a little bit and um, that was really really welcome at the time and, and something that we thank the community for 
as well. So um, I just wanted to, to, to note that. Along with um, uh, Julie was talking about things that we're doing with the community. So we've recently started something called Project Search, which is um, supporting uh, young people with autism and learning disabilities to work in the organisation um, as well. So again, part of our anchor, uh, our anchor institution work is um, is looking at those kind of things. So without repeating a lot of the things Julie said, it's 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 in the report as well. We've had a very similar experience with Brexit. So about ten percent or nine ten percent of our organisation are from the EU. We've used the EU Settled Status Scheme. Um, not all of our staff have reported that they've used that, but they're still um, able to remain in the country. So we're presuming that that's been done through that process. Similarly to guys, we do a lot of recruitment at the moment outside of the EU, particularly for nursing and uh, midwifery staff. And that's part of the uh, NHS people plan at the moment. Obviously, through some of the things we've discussed, we're looking at much more around kind of a grow your own opportunities as well. And that will kind of hopefully come to fruition in the not too distant future. Um, one of the key things again uh, around Brexit is the reputational issue um, of the UK and whether people actually see that as a valid opportunity to come and work, um, work for us. So there might be some implications of that in the longer term, but in the immediate, we haven't had a huge, um, a huge problem with that. So I'll leave that there and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mark. Um... Is Sarah, Sarah Morgan, did you want to contribute to this section? Because I've got your name down. Um, I don't really have much to add. I could, oh, add, right. about, okay, um, well, I could add about um, health and wellbeing, but I'll leave it to see if it comes up in questions, I think, because I'm conscious of time. Okay, thank you. Um, members, any questions? Um, take first from Councillor Noakes and then Councillor Rule. Thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, to Julian Mark for your reports, which are very helpful and very informative. Um, I mean, it would certainly appear, and it seems to mirror uh, the feedback that we had from social care providers uh, at our last session, that Brexit hasn't had a uh, particularly large in impact on the workforce in social care or health, it appears. Um, so I'm, ex I'm assuming that if there was going to be an impact, we would have now seen it by now. Um, I don't know if that's your view as well. But taking that into account, um, what is it that I guess that most concerns you about workforce numbers? Is it um, one sort of morale and burnout from the COVID pandemic to uh, the, the potential proposed mandatory vaccine for health staff or three, the vacancy rate and the sort of recruitment of, of new health professionals? Thank you. Um, shall I shall I join first and then maybe invite Mark to comment later? So I think on Brexit, the, the short-term impact that we thought we might feel obviously has not materialised. However, if the numbers of new entrants, particularly into the professions, drops over time as our EU workers retire or do other things, there won't be the new pipeline of supply. So health education being one of the national bodies is monitoring that nationally as we're seeing those changes. So we could feel impact, I think, of Brexit five, 10 years down the line because they left the pipe, you know, it's a leaky bucket. We're not filling the bucket and there's a hole in it. There's a, there's a real risk about Brexit in the longer term, but the immediate fears really have not been met. I think the concerns around workforce for us are in, in London, we always run kind of a vacancy factor that's pretty stable, particularly across the organisations like ours, which are very successful, well regarded organisations. We always manage to recruit, but there's always around a 10 to 12 percent vacancy factor. So it isn't really different. There's a natural kind of churn within the NHS. But I think what is a risk for us to think about is as burnout has an impact, people have choices about retiring early. They have choices about going part time. Uh, pursuing different careers and while we've not seen that yet you know the the pressure that people are under could mean that people make choices in the next one to three years that we see a, a loss of more senior experienced particularly clinical professionals on the back of the um of the pandemic's impact on the vaccination we're, we're about 90 percent of our frontline staff who are vaccinated um, colleagues spoke about the differential take up from different ethnic groups that's mirrored in our organizations around 65% of um, black staff in my organization have had the vaccine, 35% um, haven't. Um, 
Often those people are working in, in frontline roles, cleaning, portering, housekeeping, as well as clinical professional roles. That is a significant concern. And as we get those rates up, the implications of that are significant. And as I said in my report, we are ourselves affected by the care home re requirement, which we have currently 56 people we have to redeploy um, pretty quickly. Uh, otherwise, we're, we've got significant consequences about employment. So the mandatory vaccine is giving us all in the NHS a cause for concern. So to, 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 just to add to what Julie said, I think one thing particularly around workforce supply is that whilst we um, individually face our own challenges. We're now working as an ICS around workforce supply. So taking a more collaborative approach to how we manage that and looking potentially at new roles, different ways of working and things like that. So I think we're actually working together um, and we've started that piece of work in the fairly recent past. So hopefully we'll then be able to develop a trajectory, particularly for any areas that, um, that we've had concerns about in terms of supply and have a system-wide approach to that in terms of delivery of care and so on. So I think um, that's just worth noting um, because I think it's important that uh, that, that, that collaboration is being seen to be fruitful and, uh, and positive. In terms of the vaccine, I think pretty much um, would agree with what Julie said. Um, we have broadly similar um, uptake numbers for both doses. So um, kind of late 80%, early 90%, we're just finalizing the data on that at the moment. But again, a similar pattern in terms of demographic of staff who, um, who have and haven't had that. Councillor Rule? Yeah, David, Councillor Noakes has nicked all my questions. I was going to ask about the mandatory vaccines, Chair. Thank you. Is there any other questions from members? It's time? Okay. Thank you. I don't know, so if you wanted to add anything to what your colleagues have said or... No, I suppose it's just um, a reassurance really about us now working collaboratively across social care, the hospice sector, as well as healthcare, which is part of the ICS. Um, but I don't want to take away too much from what Ben might talk about. But I think that's really important because previously we've never really looked at the impact of what might happen in health on social care. So things like as we recover from elective recovery, we do need our social care colleagues to un to know about um, the numbers and what the impact might be on their workforce because we need people to be assessed to go home and so it is an end-to-end -end pathway which is um, what colleagues were speaking about earlier in terms of we've got to get that system right and I think I, that's really on our on our minds and on our agenda so it's just to um, provide a little bit of assurance around that. Thank you Sarah. So if there's no other questions for members just thank you um, Julie, Sarah and and Mark for your presentation. And then we'll move into the, the um, presentation on integrated care systems, which I think is Ben and Sam. They're there. Thank you. Hi, yeah. Nice to see you. There, there you are, Ben. Hi, Ben. So um, you should have some slides that I think um, we were planning to whiz through. Are you, are you able to show them? You you should have some slides that we were going to present. Um, yeah, yeah, we just we just getting them up now, Ben. We, uh, we've got the paper copies. Yeah, the members, yeah, the members have all got paper copies. Excellent. Well, while they're while they're coming up, I should warn you, I have a slightly truculent six-year-old on the floor below me who keeps waking up and bursting in. So, fingers crossed, I'll get through my presentation. Just to give a little bit of an update on the GLC system, approaching the development of a integrated system. Um, um, so, as you know, um, of course, back in February, I think it was, the government published its white paper promising to put this concept of integrated care systems on a statutory footing. Ben, ben sorry, can mm -hmm. I just actually suppose pause for a bit because we've got an um, annoying noise in the background. We're just trying to see where it's coming from. Just pause okay. for a few seconds. No problem. Yeah.
Thanks, Ben. If you go ahead, it's just someone in, hoovering viciously outside, <laughs> vigorously. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. So, so um, as I was saying, well, we had the government's white paper in February promising to put this concept of integrated care systems on a statutory footing, and we now, of course, have legislation going through Parliament. Um, you know, what I think this means is that, that well, the government's putting, placing all its bets, putting all its faith in this con concept of partnership working and integration as the way, the best route that we've got to, um, to improve health and care services for our populations. Um, and it's, um, you know, in doing so, I think turning its back on, on some of the other models that we've tried in the past to, to design local systems and improve care, you know, for example, um, arms, length, arms length contracting between, you know, a group of people called commissioners and a group of people called providers and using markets and competition and procurement as a way of driving change. Um, so really the, the, the concept of integrated care for me is one of partnership working um, within our boroughs and between collaborations of service providers. Um, <clears throat> so um, we're very enthusiastic about these changes. Um, and, and if you go to my second slide, um, that's really because we've been working, we've been developing this model of partnership for in Southeast London, well, for at least the last five years. Um, so, um, you know, organisations in our system have been working in what we first called the Sustainability and Transformation Partnership back in, back in 2016. We were the first official um, integrated care system in London, I think in 2018. We've been working really closely, of course, across healthcare providers and, um, and with local authority services during the pandemic. Um, so really, we've already put aside transactional ways of managing our system in favour of partnership. Um, and, and, and I guess we see this now as our chance to go further and to build further our model of collective decision making, pooling our collective resources and working together on, on, on system wide challenges. So um, if you're able to go down to my, third, my, my slide four there, um, but if not, I'll carry on talking. Um, we, our, the, the overarching structure of our ICS is around three pillars, um, so three big chunks in our partnership. And the first is what's called the Integrated Care Partnership. And that's a group of very senior leaders that will bring together, um, bring together leaders from across health and local authority services, the voluntary sector, um, representatives of, of the public. And, that, and, and, and this group's responsibility will be very much to help us set strategy, and in particular to help us think about how we bring together health and care services and join things together. Um, the second pillar um, in, in, is, is what we call our integrated care board. And that will be um, a group of leaders from, um, from health services primarily, but also with some representation from local authorities. Um, and that will be responsible for the traditional um, NHS functions of allocating resources, planning services, and overseeing the performance of NHS services. And then in our third bucket on, on the slide, we have really important partnerships within our system. So groups of organisations that will need to work together um, with, um, we hope, significant autonomy and authority to lead change. And in particular, the most important are our local care partnerships at the level of our boroughs, um, who will work together on the transformation of a core set of out of hospital services. So primary care, community services, community mental health, and how they can be brought better together with social care. Um, but also really important in this will be the collaboration between groups of NHS providers. So um, as colleagues have just mentioned, you know, acute providers working together on things like collective recovery or pooling resources so that we can better cope with workforce challenges. So those are the three, um, the three main pillars of our partnership. And I think the whole thing will hinge to hinge together really based on, do we have a common vision for our population? Are we absolutely sure how we want to work together to improve care? So if you go to my, um, my next slide, um, we are, we're a very complex, large system. 
Um, so we are obviously six boroughs, a population of close to two million, some of the largest hospitals um, in the world. Um, what we really don't want to do in all of this is create, you know, replace the, the transactional model of managing a local health system with um, commissioners and providers and contracts with, you know, a, a clunky top-down NHS bureaucracy. Um, so we really want to ensure that um, we're very clear about the decisions that come to the, the partnership and the board, and that we avoid all of decisions filtering up to those bodies. And instead we empower these different partnerships in our system, our local care partnerships and our provider collaboratives and our programs for particular, um, particular services. We really need to empower them to lead change independently um, and be quite clear about what things come up to those, the, those most senior groups. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> So all of this means some continued work um, within um, uh, my team and others in the CCG to think about the um, overarching governance of the system. Um, it also means some work that's going on that, that I'm sure that, 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 that you'll be aware of across each of our local care partnerships in our boroughs and each of our provider collaboratives on their governance arrangements. Because what we want to do is we want to be able to transfer budgets and responsibilities to those partnerships. So we want our local care partnerships, um, the, the groups of health and social care and other public services in our boroughs to take responsibility for the funding and the planning and the transformation of, of community-based care. Um, and we need to ensure that we put in place the right governance arrangements for them to be able to take those, those, those delegated responsibilities. So right now, across our six boroughs, we're thinking about things like what are the right committee structures, um, membership of committees, um, and leadership and arrangements for, for taking on those responsibilities. If we can go to the next slide. Um, so at the moment, we are quite, um, you know, we're quite focused on putting in place the nuts and the bolts of the system, you know, making sure that we've agreed the membership of our partnership and our board, um, our schemes of delegation um, for different parts of our system, so the governance nuts and bolts. But I think probably the things that will really determine our success, the things on this slide, um, you know, our vision for the population, um, the operating model that we want to introduce for our system and how that differs from the past, and the sorts of cultural and organisational infrastructure that we need to deliver faster change. So in terms of um, our vision for the population, um, <clears throat> we really want to focus, as you know, on um, the shift from treating people when they get sick to prevention of ill health and supporting well-being. We want to deliver joined up whole person care in the community wherever possible. Um, and that means some sort of quite careful rethinking of the models of care that we've developed that tend to treat individual diseases and problems within separate services as opposed to the person um, and their, their needs and their perspectives and their sense of what's important. We do need to continue to, to focus on providing, you know, rapid access to high quality care, uh, specialist care when people need it. Um, we need to join up care between these big chunks of our system, the primary and the community system, um, the hospital system and social care. And there are two areas that I just wanted to highlight to the group. I think, you know, we are really committed to a greater focus in the, in the next few years on how we address health inequalities. You know, what particular models of care will really be effective for the most deprived people in our communities and for particular uh, social groups within our communities? And how can we use our resources, not just to deliver care and help people stay well, but to build more resilient communities? So, you know, the, the anchor institution agenda, how can we use the very vast amount of money that we spend in aggr aggregates and our role as, a, uh, as the most important employer in South East London, I think, um, our role is probably the most, um, one of the most important uh, property owners and investors in assets. How can we use that in a way that helps to um, create jobs and opportunity and better living environments for people? 
Um, and then in terms of the other pillars, I think it's really fundamental that we, we think carefully about how we want to change, how we want to work, how we work together, you know, how we shift from um, a division of responsibilities in our system to working as, as partnership um, by default, um, from individual organizations holding their resources to pooling our resources in the public interest. Um, and how can we um, push decision making down within our system so people have autonomy to change? Um, if you could skip just down to the next slide. Um, and um, I think I've covered this. And if we keep, keep on going, and, and again, I just wanted to say a, a few final words on some of the intangible things that we are, that we are thinking about. So how do we introduce within our system, and this is something that, that, that Sarah's very actively involved in, how do we introduce a new way of working within our system? So how can we continue to build effective ways of working based on trusting relationships, reducing bureaucratic controls, respecting people's autonomy, um, being more open and transparent, um, and, and I guess really fundamentally, how can we work in greater partnerships with our, within our service users and communities? Um, we're thinking very carefully, again with Sarah, on how we can support our staff to play effective leadership roles across the system. And then finally, we're thinking about the, the infrastructure and capability we need to be better at innovation and improvement. I think there are really only two things that an integrated system, you know, these, um, you know, we use these badges and we attach a lot of hope to them, um, I hope, um, rightly in this case, but I think there are fundamentally only two things that an integrated system can do different to previous arrangements. Well, one is we can allocate money in different ways, we'll have more flexibility to move money around our system, and the other is that we can pursue opportunities for for innovation and improvement that were more difficult in a more fragmented system. And in particular, we can focus on improvement that spans traditional organizational and, and service boundaries. So look, I hope that's um, a useful quick overview. We've got a really busy few months ahead up until the spring where we have to do um, all sorts of um, uh, important stuff to, to transition safely to the new system. Um, but probably even more important than that is the long-term work. How do we create a system that's based on really effective partnership and team working across traditional boundaries? How can we become um, much better at involving our communities and harnessing the insights and the strengths of communities in our work? How can we support staff better and how can we focus on improvement? Um, I hope that that was um, useful and what you were expecting. Thanks, Ben. Um, have we got any additional comments from Sam? Because I know Sam, you're there. Hi, Chair. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I suppose what just might be helpful is if we uh, just sort of give some context to what we're doing in Southwark. So um, as Ben has referenced, place is incredibly important for the South East London ICS. Um, and uh, he talked about local care partnerships. Uh, and in Southwark, our local care partnership is Partnership Southwark, uh, which you've heard a lot about in the past. Um, and we're working uh, to develop and to be ready for the 1st of April next year. We're working very much uh, in partnership with uh, all of the partners in Partnership Southwark, which includes council, uh, voluntary and community sector, our acute trusts, our um, mental health trusts, our GP practices, PCNs, uh, pharmacies. Um, we're very much concentrating on, at the moment, uh, our uh, COVID recovery plan. Um, I think you've heard about that before, the different areas that we are focusing on. Um, as At the same time, in parallel, uh, developing the governance and the leadership required from the 1st of April, because as Ben said, uh, the local care partnership will receive a delegation down from the integrated care board um, and it has to be fit for purpose in order to uh, discharge that delegation. So I just wanted to give a little bit of context of, of what we're doing um, locally in Southwark and just to um, reiterate that Partnership Southwark has been working for the last couple of years. This is not something that we have developed um, in the last couple of weeks. Um, and we're building on partnerships that have been developed across Southwark for a number of years, um, putting them on more of a formal footing um, in order to 
um, sort out some of the some of those historical issues that maybe we haven't been able to sort out previously. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Um, questions, um, Councillor Noakes, and then Councillor Williams. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ben, for your presentation. Um, I'm going to play the sceptic here a little bit. Um, I, I've, I've been a councillor and involved with sort of from a council perspective with health uh, since 2006, and obviously in that time we've seen primary care trusts uh, replace when the Health and Social Care Act with uh, local borough CCGs and then replaced with area CCGs. And now obviously we have another, what some people will see as another top-down reform of the health service to, to ICSs. And um, you, did, you did sort of touch a little bit about on what you, as I suppose my, my question is, why do we need an ICS? And, and you touched a little bit on why you think we need an ICS. But um, I think there are fears and concerns from some stakeholders and residents and patients uh, that in a sense it feels like whereas we had sort of I mean I think one of the perhaps only positives that we can say about the Health and Social Care Act is it, it did feel like it was bringing in some democratic accountability and uh, also trying to address that sort of um, that connection I suppose with with, with local people um, and I'm just not sure it just feels like the decision making is is going further and further away and, and is becoming more and more distant and I'm just not sure how the accountability in this new system exists for patients for elected politicians uh, and for residents um and i don't know there may not have been any developments on this but obviously there's i understand there was a question mark about whether health and well-being boards will continue uh, and i don't know if there's been any further developments in the in the legislation uh, in regards to that but um yeah i mean I mean, the other thing, I suppose my final point would just be to say that um, this sort of holy grail of integrated health and social care, we keep being promised every time there's a reform of the health service that that's what it's going to deliver. Um, why should we be any more confident that ICS is going to deliver that than the previous um, organisations and, and structures that we've had? Just before you try and answer that, can I just say, is your a quick question as well? Yeah, mine is. Okay. And then take them both together. Thank you, Ben. And um, just like Councillor Noakes, I've been around a while and I remember the first ever NHS reorganisation called the Griffiths Review in 84. Um, my question is around governance of this new structure. And if you go to your slide where you've got your three pillars, um, the IC partnership, the IC board, and then the governance and development. Um, and I wonder if you can foresee any issues and i'm talking to the one the one in the middle the ic board um and it's the last bullet point can you see any can you foresee any issues where there is a difference between um the national priorities and cell priorities or a difference between regional priorities i.e london priorities and cell priorities or even a difference between cell priorities and Southwark priorities and how would they be resolved? Ben, you want to take that first or Sam, to you? Ben, you're on mute. Um, so I was saying that I'm not sure if I want to take any of these questions because they're fiendishly difficult. Um, and I've also been involved in health and care for quite a while, and I've seen the acronyms change with astonish astonishing speed. So I understand why people are sceptical. I'm, you know, um, what I would say is that I don't think we need to hang our hat on the concept of an ICS, you know, the latest acronym. I think we need to hang our hat if we believe in it on the concept of partnership. Um, the, 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 the really difficult problems that we face within health and care and that have been around for a very long time um, are not the sorts of, of problems that can be solved by individual organisations within the health system um, uh, or, or, or even necessarily within the health system at all. The, you know, these are the, the big challenges, you know, how do we keep people out of our A&Es? How do we keep people well? How do we... Um, how do we ensure rapid access to care, to, to specialist care when people need it? All of these big intractable problems, how do we look after people effectively um, at end of life? They're all system problems. They all require a large group of partners to pool their, 
their insights and their expertise and their resources, and they will require action across the whole system. So I personally believe in, in, in that concept because the health systems that I've seen in, in, in England and around the world that have tackled these big problems are the sorts of health systems that worked in that way. Um, so for me personally, I focus on this concept of partnership working and cross-system innovation. And um, what the latest acronym is from the centre about that is, is, is the secondary issue. Um, so I hope that answers. I hope, um, I don't know whether that will win you over, but it, it gives my perspective on why should we think that this is any different. Um, I think one of your questions was, well, we've been told that we're going to integrate health and care with every every recent reform why is this going to be any different i think that's down to us frankly um you know so the the structural and budgetary differences between health and care will remain i think um but there's a vast amount that we can do at the level of Southwark and our other boroughs if we're really committed to bringing services together um and and you know you know there's, there's a lot that we can do to enable um, you know, our community nursing and primary care staff and our social care staff to work in more effective ways together. Um, but I don't think that, I think, you know, if we get that right, it will be because we get it right internally. I mean, you get it right internally rather than um, the system finding the magic bullet. Um, so um, you, you, you raised a number of questions about governance and decision making going further and further away and the risk that we lose democratic accountability. And I can understand why you're asking those questions because this, you know, this is a big system, population of two million. Um, you know, there is a risk that that, that decision making becomes more bureaucratic and more um, and, and more distant. I think we're trying to address that through the operating principles for our system, but the proof will be in the pudding terms of how we enact them um, <clears throat> and I think there's also just as, as you mentioned councillor just a huge tension between the fact that we are a, a national health system funded through taxation nationally um, we do get a vast amount of directives down from the national NHS to systems like ours which then have to filter through to partnerships within our systems um, and the challenge will be that there is no doubting that we will have to focus on delivering national priorities. And the challenge will be to find a way of carving out enough space for us to do the things that we think are really important alongside those national priorities. But I don't, um, um, I, I'm, I'm, I won't deny that that's gonna be quite a challenge in a pressurized funding environment and a politically very sensitive health service. Um, I hope that answers some of your questions. I'm sure that I've ducked a few of them along the way. Um, yeah, well, I think have... there, was one, there was one question about the Health and Wellbeing Board, which I think we can mm. we can put yeah. to bed, which is, um, Councillor Noakes is that Health and Wellbeing Boards are will stay, will remain. And actually in Southwark, we've also agreed um, with the Health and Wellbeing Board that the Local Care Partnership um, strategic board will have a reporting line into the health and well-being board so that there's a clear link between the health and well-being board setting the priorities and the strategy and the local care partnership being um, responsible for delivering those so it, it sort of starts to to bake in what we already have with what is emerging as a partnership approach as Ben talked about. That makes me think, Sam, that one of the things I meant to pick up on was this question of how can we maintain democratic accountability and, um, you know, and, and build on our relationship with the public. And I did think, you know, the model of local care partnerships that you're building in Southwark and in the other boroughs, which will bring together healthcare um, staff and um, officers of the local authority to lead the... Um, the shaping uh, of, of, of local services. That I think is a really interesting opportunity um, to, to, to maintain local democracy. And I also wanted to mention, Sam, the work that you're, um, you're the independent chair of, of, of your Southwark partnership, Anu Singh is leading for us. And Anu, of course, as well as being your independent chair, um, is a former director within NHS England focused on um, public involvement and an expert and she's doing a piece of work that will conclude uh, uh, for us next year thinking about how we can become much better at involving patients and the public in our work and I'm just hugely excited about that I think that's just a really great opportunity to shift from um, 
sort of forums and structures that allow people to express a view but may not give people vast amount of influence over the shape of health and care to giving people much much more active roles in 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 shaping services i'm just really excited about the models that i see around england where you know we, we give people from deprived communities paid roles as improvement advisors and they bring their personal expertise and experience as service users uh, alongside professionals to help us to uh, to rethink our services so so there are really some some really exciting things that i think we could do there thank you ben and sam but i think i think i just want to follow what both councillors are saying about how can you maintain that local buy-in from the, for example so that because we're quite a radical um borrow in a sense that there's certain things that we'll say we want to do X, Y, and Z with Lambeth and Lucian, because given we've got a lot of the social deprivation areas compared to the other part of the um, South East London network of um, um, Bexley, Bromley and Greenwich. So I, I think we're concerned about how do we, we make sure we have appropriate um, care service and health and social care service after the integration from April 2022 and making sure it meets the needs of our residents across those three deprived boroughs in a wider South East London group that may not see some of the priorities that we have, you know, um, and we have a transit and we do have aspects of our boroughs that are quite transient as well. So we want to make sure we do have some local democracy to be able to say it's not just national priorities, just determine what we do and how we deliver our service from April 2022. <laughs> And I think that's where the local care partnership really comes in, um, Chair. Um, I mean, because you've got all of the local partners around there with all of, including public health, who've got all of our lo very local information. We also, as part of our governance, we have also agreed we'll have a lived experience forum, which will make sure that we are capturing the, the experiences of local residents to feed into that. So I think that's where we need to put our effort in is getting our local care partnership as effective as we possibly can with the right information with the right data guiding those decisions um, so that we are reacting to and and proactively responding to our local population mm -hmm. Absolutely. thanks um, and last but not least um councillor smith yeah thank you chair um i'm just trying to make sure i've got this right in my head as far as the new IC board is concerned, it says bringing together leaders. Is it exclusively people, professionals in the health service, or, or is there room on the board for voluntary groups who would have maybe some input in, being on the ground, if you like, and might even play a scrutinising role? You know, I, I, I argue, for, for instance, um, the Southwark Pensioners Action Group you know, who um, are f fairly local and want to be involved with something like this. So is that the case? Um, sh shall I take this one, Sam? So um, we really want to ensure that we have the voluntary sector at the heart of, of our system. Um, and for me personally, um, my personal angle on this is because I see levels of innovation and social entrepreneurship in the voluntary sector that... Um, that, that, that is sometimes miles away from 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 health and traditional welfare services. So, so for me personally, you know, there's a sort of a, a, a real desire to bring those skills into into the into our system. Um, I think there'll be a powerful role for the voluntary sector on our integrated care partnership. That's thinking about how to um, um, how to integrate care, but also I think will play a really leading role, senior leadership role in um, population health, how we address inequalities, and how we deliver our anchor role, how we support community resilience, and also um, at the level of our local care partnerships with people like Sam and Anu Singh. Um, we see the voluntary sector also having a really powerful role and, 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 and a, a, um, a there. We don't have a place on our board for the voluntary sector. Um, that's because we're caught between a rock and a hard place in terms of the, um, 
the requirements by NHS England in terms of the people we've got to have on our boards, um, the restrictions to ensure that our boards are not too big and can be effective. Um, um, so, so those restrictions are such that, you know, some of the biggest hospitals in the world may not have a seat on our board, even though they're slap in the middle of South East London. And that's the, the pressure of um, designing effective governance arrangements for such a large system. But I do think um, right, that we'll have you. the voluntary sector where, where, where it's needed. Thank you, Ben and, and Sam. Thank you. I mean, I think if there's any more questions from members, we'll, we'll send it to you because I think it's important to have that discussion because if we don't have that scrutiny role and have the voluntary sector involved at as many levels as possible, we'll be having this conversation in a year, two years' time saying, oh, well, it, you know, it, it's gone past the people you're supposed to be delivering to and, and you'll be doing community involvement in a vacuum, really, you know, when the horse is bolted, really. Thank you for your presentation today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. to continue um and did you want to no i was just wondering whether it's possible to have a comfort break all right sorry um yeah it's it's for a few minutes. 8 43 if we just have a comfort break for seven minutes till till 8 50 yeah okay
Okay, thank you everybody. If we want to resume the meeting and with the presentation from Sam about GP appointments, or do you just want to take questions from us? Because I think there's a number of questions from people. It might be easier because you've had my pack. Yeah. Um, obviously we tried to cover what you asked for, but um, obviously there might be further questions or further information that you want. So we can always add to that um, chair, but okay. yeah, happy to take questions. Could could I just, um, just ask, yeah. I came in at the very end of the conversation you were having with Councillor Okoto, um, just to say about um, GPs taking on more patients, um, on average, um, GPs get paid £155 per patient per year. So it isn't certainly an economic decision that they're making to take on more patients because you only have to see a patient twice and you've used up your £155 per year on average. Um, what we don't want is practices closing their books so people can't register. Uh, because that also causes us a problem. So just thought, just for context, and as you can see from the pack, um, on average in Southwark, one GP co covers about 2,700 patients. The average for the country is around 2,000. So our Southwark GPs are actually covering more patients than, than nationally because we don't have as many GPs in Southwark um, uh, than they do in other uh, healthier, wealthier areas. So just to give you a little bit of context, in, in no way it's justifying any of the, the feedback that you gave. I just thought it might be helpful just to have that little bit of context. Thanks, Sam. Any questions? Okay. <laughs> Councillor Noakes. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Sam, for what's a very comprehensive report, actually, I have to say. Um, so I, I guess I'm going to say first that obviously um, in no, no way is there any implied criticism of the, of the work that GPs and the other staff in, in GP practices are doing because um, they've obviously made, like the rest of NHS staff, heroic efforts over the last 20 months and, and they're to be applauded for that. Um, but I just want to, to sort of feed back a little bit. I mean, I... Um, just anecdotally using my own experience, I actually tried to contact my GP surgery the other day and um, I had to wait an hour and 12 minutes before I was answered. Uh, I was told I was in position one after 30 minutes and despite that, I continued to, to wait for another 42 minutes before I was answered. Um, I'd say once I did get through, uh, my, my question around the flu jab was well answered and, and I've since had my flu jab, so, so congratulations there. But, um, you know, I think despite what your report says about satisfaction levels certainly again anecdotally that i suppose it's always people who are unhappy who complain but obviously there are, there's quite a lot of concern i think out there in the community about being able to access gps and particularly to get appointments um the other thing i sort of want to comment on and this is where i'm really looking for answers is is um obviously the government made its announcement in october about the 250 million that it was going to make available to boost um appointments and i think they were particularly looking for more physical person-to-person -person appointments. Um, and my understanding is that that money can be used to employ extra GPs and locums. And obviously, the, I think the most concerning thing in your report was the fact that the number of GPs uh, has gone down in Southwark since 2015. And, the f and what you just referred to, which is that, you know, our GPs are now looking after even more patients than they were in 2015, um, a sort of 31% increase. But... Um, my question is, I guess, uh, does so this this extra two hundred and fifty million? Do you know how much Southwark is going to get of that? That's a national um, pot, I believe. Um, and my understanding is that if GP practices um, don't provide enough face-to-face -face appointments, they will not be given access to this funding. And I just wondered, do you know if all of our GP surgeries, because they can also use the money to upgrade telephone systems and things like that, as well as trying to get more staff? So. Firstly, is are all our practices seeking to make use of this additional money? Um, and are you expecting any of our Southwark GPs to fail to be able to access the money because they haven't provided enough face-to-face -face appointments? Thank you. Um, so uh, I think your first question was more of a um, feedback. Um, so uh, I, I think we have to acknowledge that we had um, uh, different 
uh, experiences and unwarranted variation across our practices before COVID. Um, and we still have. Um, and so I think it's fair to say we have some practices that have uh, responded positively and come out of uh, the pandemic in a better place than other practices. Um, we have got some that are struggling with workforce. So in, in no way did I mean to in any way present in my pack that it was a great situation that we had across all of our practices in Southwark. We absolutely recognise there are concerns. And I think you will see from the um, patient satisfaction survey that whilst um, there are some positives in there, there are some, some, some very unhappy people and only a, a small uh, section of the community complete that survey. So we do recognise that that is flawed, but it's all we have to work with. Um, hopefully each practice does utilise their, their PPG to get that feedback, but we also know that does, that doesn't work in every practice. So I absolutely accept we, we have got that variation across. With regards to the 250 million, um, I think it's fair to say that the guidance around this 250 million and the way that it was um, uh, presented to the GP community uh, didn't go according to the government's plan um, and there was a quite a uh, an adverse reaction to it which is a little unfortunate really because um, I think if it had been presented in a slightly different way we would have got a more positive um, response. Having said that um, just to be really clear so you understand the 250 million is non-recurrent money so it all finishes on the 31st of March next year. So in effect, it is uh, less than five months worth of money going into general practice. We have got a long term problem with the workforce and with the way that general practice across the country is delivered. It's not going to be sold with £250 million worth of non-recurrent money to be spent in five months on a workforce that just doesn't exist. So, yes, we can use that money for locums, but there is not a big cupboard of locums sitting there waiting to come out. Um, it has driven the price up of locums. So you now get a lot less for your money because there's 250 million floating around the system and they can basically name their price. So um, uh, originally they did say that for some practices, Bizarrely, the most the practices probably in the most need of investment wouldn't qualify for this money if they weren't offering the uh, if they didn't meet a certain criteria. They've now removed most of that, which means that all of our practices in Southwark, to answer your question, can access this money. To be honest, we weren't going to get into a position where some of our practices were not going to be able to access it because we felt that every practice needed some form of support um, and it was uh, it was detrimental to our local community to have practices who weren't getting that support in order to imp improve access. So to answer your question, uh, we are getting around 8 million um, into South East London. Um, now that works out about just over a million for Southwark. Uh, the reason why it's slightly less than the sixth of the money is that we have uh, as part of the money that was part of the criteria of this money. We also need to invest in 111 capacity, which is across South East London. And we also need to invest in our emergency and urgent care hubs. So that co is coming out of that. So our practices will have access to about uh, oh, um, we're all dark then um, uh, about a million pounds. Um, and we have about 30 practices. Um, what we've encouraged them to do is to think not just as individual practices, but how they can work together um, in order to improve resilience. So there is a, a range of different ideas that are coming through. We've put them back to NHS England and we're hoping to hear next week whether that has been approved. And then I can confirm just how much is coming into, into Southwark. Um, 
we have there there is a number of things that it, this money is is designed to do but you're right it the numbers of face to face appointments um increasing is its main outcome i would also put a caveat on the data that they are looking at so the data that the that nhs england are using and are publishing has got huge amounts of flaws in it so um in no way am i suggesting that we are back to um 100% of our appointments being offered face to face some of the data that is being produced is is not accurate um and it's not pulling through correctly from the um gps systems so the first job we need to do is make sure we get that right because we could be comparing something that's uh pre <laughs> pandemic with after pandemic which is uh, is not accurate so i hope i've answered your question councillor next Any other members got any questions? Oh, um, I can't Ch yeah. One, I'll think of something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Unfortunately, the GP practices have come under a lot of criticism over just recent times. Do you have a view whether this may be a, a political on a political agenda in order to put down GP services so that the um, the, the, if you like, the private sector can move in. Let's talk about American companies, you know, hovering over uh, above us, looking for this type of work. I don't know. Any thoughts about that? Um, well, obviously, as an NHS employee, I can't comment on uh, political uh, policy. But what I would say is that I don't think that the GP leaders, the national GP leaders have helped themselves in this particular uh, uh, area. Uh, I think uh, we needed to recognise, they should have recognised that there were issues with the way general practice is currently working. It's got a very outdated contract, um, the way that it has been commissioned, the way that um, medical uh, students are trained to be GPs, the fact that um, uh, general practice is not seen as a career for many uh, professionals. I think that would have been a better approach rather than going on the defensive. Um, and I don't think that they are representing general practice in the way they should be. Um, I think uh, that is adding to this. And I think I came in at the end of the comments from um, Councillor Okoto, we have seen, you're absolutely right, we have seen some uh, really unfortunate behaviour directed at general practice and their staff. Um, and some of that is because they are also delivering the part of the COVID vaccination programme, as you know. So they are, they're on the front line for both frustrated um, uh, patients who cannot access care but also the anti-vaxxers um, who ha are targeting them because they're providing that service. So they, they are in a difficult place. Um, I just think the national leadership could have done a better job of representing their, their views and, and their position. Can I just Thank you. On, just one off from my colleague, Councillor um, Charlie Smith. Do you think that, I suppose in a cynical way, COVID-19 has just highlighted some of the... Um, I suppose antiquated or old um, delivery um, systems of the GP service. So that's made them actually have to transform literally overnight the way they deliver that GP service at, at, the, at the primary care and local level. And unfortunately, it's highlighted some of the, as you, what you were saying, that some of the inefficient ways of delivering care they did before. So now COVID has probably highlighted that and there's no going back anymore. Is there, Sam? No, I, and I think you're right. So there are some real positives. So whilst it doesn't suit everybody to have a telephone or a video consultation, we've got a big tranche of our population that it does. They just, they they want, uh, so for, uh, you know, there are many people that just want to have one conversation. They Continuity of care is not that important to them. And we have a big tranche of our community that it is really important. Um, and I think what this has exposed is that um, general practice 
doesn't quite know yet how to deal with those different sorts of their population. They've had one operating model. Um, generally, I don't want to lump all of general practice in together because we have some really good innovative practices, but generally, general practice is being delivered in the same way as it was probably 30, 40 years ago. There aren't many services that can claim to do, to do that. Um, and part of that is because of the way, it's the contract that they've got in place um, and the way they are funded um, and the way that they are, they're monitored and deliver, they deliver their services. So I, I, I agree with you, Chair. I think what it has done it's exposed, there's many parts of the health and care system that it is exposed, but general practice, uh, probably because it is frontline, it's for, for many people, it's the first place they go when they're feeling poorly or, or not coping. This has just exposed just how important it is to the community and just how uh, uh, some practices don't just yet understand how to respond to those needs of the different parts of their community that they serve. Councillor Noakes, I was going to say something, but yeah, go on. Go um, sorry, was, thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, it was just to very quickly pick up on the point about the, the fact that our, we do have less GPs in Southwark at the moment and, and they are managing larger numbers, the 2,700 figure. Um, is that, I mean, is there, is, is there plans to increase the number of GPs in Southwark? Is, is that part of our, our, our response to, to the current issues? Um, so we have a plan to increase the number of GPs, but we our main plan is to increase the the sorts of people that are working in general practice that aren't necessarily GPs, and then to get the public confident that they don't have to see a GP every time. So I think in my pack um, at the back, we had um, a, a little bit of a summary of the different sorts of roles that are going into general practice now. Um, I think we've got to recognise that there isn't a huge supply, um, a huge pipeline, as Julie said earlier on, of GPs. Um, it's not, they don't do themselves any favours because um, it. <laughs> if you read uh, most of the uh, papers at the moment, you wouldn't think that general practice was a place to go and work. Um, so I think we're recognising that whilst we do need to have a certain body of general practice, uh, practitioners in in practices we also need a range of different skill sets um, and that's what the additional roles reimbursement scheme which is at the back of your pack shows that that's that's really where we are concentrating our efforts on um, to attract paramedics mental health workers physiotherapists uh, you know different sorts of people that can come into the practice um, to support the practice team we've then got to um, encourage um, the public that they it's okay to see somebody else but the GP that they they can trust other professions to to deal with their issues. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. But also, I just want to final comment that we also have to remember not everybody wants to go digital. And I think it's important that through all these um, brave new world of digitization, ICSs and whatever, there's got to be scope for people who want to do the traditional ways and elderly people who, and an assumption in Southwark there's a lot of people with COVID-19 it's actually highlighted the people that the digital divide between the have and the have not so making sure that if we have got a digital offer we have to make sure there's also a non-digital offer of the people who have got access to those resources because I'm really concerned that all this has been rolled and quickly and you forget that there's a significant number in our borough who haven't got access to those resources at all and they're really going to be absolutely. left behind. If you speak to many GP practice staff, um, they recognise that. But I think what you probably also recognise is that not all of our premises are in a place where you can have safe, uh, at the moment, because of infection control um, requirements, um, they can't go back to the numbers of face-to-face -face appointments yet. They are not at that stage. So it's, there's some fundamental issues there, Chair. I absolutely agree with you. We've got to have this, this range of different offers um, for our population, and we've got to understand what that looks like. But there is also an infrastructure issue. So as Councillor Noakes mentioned earlier on, we've got to think about telephony. 
uh, and maybe you know uh, investment in a in a telephone system that's responsive rather than um one that's uh maybe from the 1800s but you know so so i think there's 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 lots of consequences to to what's playing out now um, and the way the general practice has to respond to that thank you sam if there's no oh sorry finally councillor linford hall yeah Thank you. On that note, Sam, thank you very much for your presentation. I should say that the most important thing at the moment is, first of all, the length of time that you have to wait for a GP to, to contact you. And the other one is the inefficiency of the front of house, i.e. the reception. The receptionists are absolutely dreadful throughout the, the practices in, in SADAC, not only on the practice uh, that uh, is close to me, but others, because I have heard from other people. And it, it, it cannot be like that, because if you're having to rely not on a face-to-face -face consultation, but on a telephone uh, call back, and the people from the front of house don't deliver that, don't even pass a message, or and they are rude and inefficient all the time. And it takes, like Consular Knox mentioned, it can take you an hour and a half to two hours sometimes to be on the telephone, especially all people are suffering an awful lot because of this. You cannot ask somebody to wait on a telephone for over an hour, sometimes close to two hours, and then they said they call you back again and then they don't call back. So there's an awful lot of problems at the moment that I think the front of house is the thing that has to be addressed primarily, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for your presentation. I know there's been a lot of questions, but I think there are still concerns about GP appointments. But thanks again for your presentation tonight. You're very welcome. And if there's any further information that you need, then please let me know. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Members, if we turn over um, item number nine, the review of domestic abuse. The draft scope I, I mean really i think just for information because we want to focus on that because we picked up from i think a year ago maria when you mentioned that and said we need to focus on that um the information is there yeah. if you want to add anything to it i mean i think it is important you know it's like what outcomes we look we even have an interview maybe with the um councillor liana warner a deputy cabinet member for yes yeah, 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 Councillor Leanne Werner can definitely come along. Um, because she is a Deputy Cabinet Member, she would need to come along with the Cabinet Lead because she's not accountable in the same way that a Cabinet, uh, a cabinet Member is. But um, I think um, she's down there. Uh, I'm not quite sure if it would be Darren or Evelyn. Um, yeah, Darren Marin. I think it's it Darren now. Uh, it could be. No, I think I it's... Yeah, oh, well. Um, health, yeah, I think I think it's possibly that they're, they're really split between the now. two. Yeah, um, and it may be that um, is is it Councillor Darren Merrill who's a cabinet? Yeah. yeah, it may be that it might be it might be um, good to get him along because you have yeah. you've have, you've heard from um, Councillor Okoto earlier. Um, but I can I can go and liaise yeah. with Leanne and yeah. the, you know, and just find out because yeah. maybe Evelyn may want to put an input. Not yeah. to attend, but let's say this is how I see it from how it fits into my brief, and then um, Darren, because I think that'd be really good. Actually. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. So if, there's, if there's any other input as well, um, that would be helpful. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Do you remember that we talked before that the, some of the people, some of the charities were not really included, yeah. and they are still not included. Really? Okay. Oh, so, so they, we tried to put some in the slide. It's on page four, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, but I was going to um, email around uh, and contact the domestic abuse lead and get some more. Yeah. If you've got any other uh, charities, because the, the aim is that the session on um, February would be a round table with charities. Yeah. So there would be lots of time to outreach to all of them. But if you've okay. got any, please send Good. them to me and we'll include Good. and we'll do more research to get more charities. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That was the only comment. Yeah. 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 Y
Any other comments, anybody? Any other comments, anyone? No? Well, just, just to say that, you know, it's out, it's, Southwark has one of the highest volumes of domestic violence in London. Yeah. Oh, that's just incredible, it really is. And the fact that I heard it on the radio yesterday, they were talking about what it says here about uh, child to parent violence. I was just about to say well. that I'm really concerned about aspects yeah. like 70% just in COVID. And I'm just like, I don't know if we can at least get some groups to talk about the phenomenon know. because that's because um, when you think of um, um, what well, I would, yeah. would be interested to know is, is the um, involvement of the police in domestic violence. Um, Incidents, you know. I mean, I, I know they're trained better than what they were years ago. Where they come along and go, it's all right, dear. He's okay. You know what I mean? But but they've been trained up a bit more. But um, I, I would be interested to know just how involved the police do. You know, come. I just want to make make such. Oh, sorry. Yeah. In answer to um, Charlie. Um, I, I wouldn't say it was domestic abuse, but I did have an incident with my teenager where the police came round. They came round within 20 to 30 minutes of when I phoned up. It was two young guys. Um, and they they didn't just pat me on the head and say, oh, we'll be all right. They took away my child, even though my parents' side of me was thinking, oh, they took away my child, um, so that I was safe. So I, I would agree that the, the attitudes have changed lately, you know? Um, so I wouldn't say it was... It's nice to hear it from the police, though. Yeah, yeah. so I, I do think they've got a different angle on it than what we historically... Yeah. I think I, they're more aware, at least. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Pick, picking up from that, obviously I was going to go back to se Section six, 6 on the scope, saying that when we tease it out, like the police, it'd be good to hear from them what's their approach to, what's their protocols at the moment, report um, in supporting domestic violence. Um, incidents and especially for me i think i'd want to hear about how do they deal with child to parent because when you say child what is a child is it is it age 10 11 is it is it age of criminal responsibility or to them is it a child 12 and upwards and whatever and how do they deal with it under i'm under 18 but, but it depends on who you talk to because police for some things they might think well children for us is 11 and upwards but also if somebody's domestic violence if someone's presenting as a child in crisis how is, is it dealt with a mental health issue or is it just it's domestic violence that's it or yeah, yeah. a child's beating up their parent we just have to lock them up so it's more punitive rather than it's more complex more complex how do they assess it my my question i'd want to see how do the police assess it or do they just come to an incident and say why right, i'm gonna you know i'm gonna arrest this child because they're being violent and then take them to a safe place or is it just take them to the police station and let them calm down it's about learning about how they deal with it now and hearing from children's services how they're dealing with it because they've got to be more of a, for me, a person-centred approach, a more therapeutic approach now rather than just, let's just sweep them up or put them in temporary custody or foster care and whatever. Um, and like you say, Marie, if there's really specific organisations in the Latin American community and whatever, it'd be important to get. And I think some of the percentages are not 100%, right? Yeah. Uh, because again, that's the issue. some of the associations reports are not included in that, so yeah. the percentages are low in my opinion. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Um, statistics. The statistics. Accurate statistics. Yeah, accurate statistics. Yeah. Accuracy. Okay. So you want us to get more accurate ones, or are you concerned about them? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Because also, like you're saying, the referrals, not everybody may have used the formal process and referrals. And, yeah, that's true. Yeah, because it's like with anything, for every one crime, there's two or three that goes unreported, yeah. isn't it? It's probably similar to domestic violence as well. Is there any other comments, questions? If you've got any other, we'll send it to Julie and then we'll have a whole list of organisations, isn't it? Um, last but not least, if we go to the health, health and social care workforce, that's on... That scope proposal is on page six of your supplement, is that supplementary agenda. Um, I think a lot of it's been covered today about impact of Brexit, pandemic yeah, and whatever. So we can flesh that out. I mean, I'm still I'm still not convinced that Brexit hasn't got um, an impact. But then, like, I think what um, Julie said that it's going to be five, ten years later, I thought it would be maybe it's been conflated with COVID and for me they've made it the shortfall by having people from non-EU um, countries to fill that short um, shortfall so maybe it's not hasn't been as severe as we expected I was quite surprised really 
Um, David, did you want to say something? Um, I was going to say, so, so my understanding of this particular scope is this is just taking the previous scope that we had just to look at the impact of Brexit, to widen it, to include um, the impact of the mandatory vaccine and also the morale and um, of the workforce, etc., and the potential impacts of that. That, that's essentially what this is doing, is that right? Yeah, and mandatory vaccination, yeah, so you've got that in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, one of the points that we made at the previous meeting of that, we're doing that, they've been as much mm. as possible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you've got any comments then, do you think? Yeah, I think especially, especially the introduction of the mandatory vaccinations, I think that's an impact because that's kicking in now. Yeah, because, yeah, because for care work. Phone close Sorry. to the microphone. If someone's got a phone, phone close, close to the, the microphone, microphone. Just <laughs> <back>. <laughs> someone's moved it. Yeah, because I, I think that's an important point from David about mandatory vaccination because the social care, it's not mine. The social care workers is now it's November and obviously for the rest of the health service it's March. It's spring 2020. So for me, why is there a lag and why is there two particular dates and stuff? Because in the social care industry, we're seeing a lot of people leaving at the moment. You know, and, and there's not as many redeployment within the industry, so I think we need to pick that up. Um, is any other comments, anybody? And last but not least, the work program. I think that's just quite straightforward, really. If there's yeah. additions, that's quite straightforward. Um, yeah, February and March, and then that's it. Okay, if there's no other comments, close the meeting now. It's 9.22. Thank you for your...